Hello and welcome to another episode of Interactive Biology TV, where we're making biology fun. My name is Leslie Samuel, and in this episode, episode 37, I'm going to talk about how sound is transferred to the inner ear. Let's revisit an animation that we looked at in the last episode. We looked at this animation that showed how when you hear something, there are sound waves that are entering into the air, and those sound waves come in contact with the eardrum, the tympanic membrane. That tympanic membrane vibrates back and forth, back and forth, and that vibration is transferred to the three bony ossicles, the malleus, incus, and stapes. It's connected to the cochlea, and that's going to cause something to happen in the cochlea that's going to cause a signal to go via the auditory nerve to the brain. And that is how we hear. Now, what we're going to talk about is what happens in the process of moving that sound, transferring the sound to the inner ear. And later on, we're going to look at what happens inside the cochlea. So let's get into some more detail. So here we're looking at a structure of the ear, and we have the outer ear. So I'm going to refer to this part up until the tympanic membrane or the eardrum as the outer ear. Then we have this section here with the malleus, incus, and stapes, the eustachian tube. This is called the middle ear. Forgive my writing there. <laughs> and then we have with the cochlea, the semicircular canals, and the nerves, and so on, that's called the inner ear. And we're going to be talking about the process of sound being transferred from the outer and middle ear to the inner ear. Now, here's the deal. In the external auditory canal that's in here, we have air. In the eustachian tube that's in here, we have air once again. However, inside the cochlea, we don't have air. We actually have fluid. Now, because of that, it's going to be harder to get the fluid inside the cochlea to vibrate than it is to get the air inside the middle ear and inside the outer ear to vibrate. Think about it this way. If you're running in air, which when you're running, you're usually running in air, that is not as hard as if you're trying to run in water. So in order for us to have the same strength of signal out here and in the cochlea, in the fluid inside the cochlea, something needs to happen. And that process is called impedance matching. So impedance matching. Impedance is basically resistance and we're trying to match the amount of resistance here to the amount of resistance here. We want the same signal in the fluid in the cochlea that we have in the air inside the outer air. And <laughs> this can sound a little confusing because um, sometimes I'm referring to air and sometimes I'm referring to the air. All right. But what we're basically saying is when the signal comes here and causes the tympanic membrane to vibrate, we want the signal to be transferred with the same amount of strength to that fluid inside the cochlea. So we have to go through this process of impedance matching. And there are two ways that impedance matching is accomplished. Let's look at the first way. Here we have the three bony ossicles, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes that's attached to the oval window here. Now, I'm going to draw the malleus, incus, and stapes over here in a very simple way. So let's say this is the malleus, this is the incus, and this is the stapes. Now, it makes sense that if this vibrates back and forth, 
So let's say it's going back and forth. That's going to cause, this is the malleus, that's going to cause the incus to vibrate back and forth. And then that's going to cause the stapes also to vibrate back and forth. However, because of the way these are connected and the hinges that we have between these three bones, I'm not necessarily going to get the same amount of movement here as I get here. I can orchestrate this in a way that when this moves, these are connected so that this will move even more than this is moving. It'll move a greater distance. And this is exactly how the malleus, incus, and stapes are set up so that we have a movement ratio of 1.3 to 1. In other words, and I'm going to take a random number, if this moves one micrometer back and forth, this is going to move 1.3 micrometers back and forth. So we're going to get more movement here than we are getting here, and that is going to cause increased pressure on the oval window. So we're going to have a certain amount of pressure here, but the amount of pressure we get on that oval window is going to be greater. This is exactly what you want because you want to move the fluid inside the cochlea the same amount, you want the same amount of vibration that we have inside of the tympanic membrane so that you can send an accurate signal to the brain via the cochlear nerve, or another name for this is the auditory nerve. So the first way to compensate for the fact that we have fluid in here is by having a movement ratio of 1.3 to 1 between the stapes and the malleus. That is the first way. Now let's talk about the second way. Here, once again, we have the tympanic membrane or the eardrum, and here we have the oval window. Now you will notice something about the size of the two. The tympanic membrane is larger than the oval window. To be more specific, it's approximately 18.6 times larger. Now why is this significant? I'm glad you asked. Let's take a very graphic example. Let's say we have a surface here, and we're going to say that that surface is your leg. On top of that leg, we're going to put a block. Let's say we have a brick. What happens if someone comes along and decides they want to punch that brick with a certain amount of force? They punch that brick, it's on top of your leg, and you might say, ow, because it might hurt. I hope that makes sense. Now let's take a different situation where, once again, we have your leg, but instead of having a brick, we have, brace yourself, a needle. I know what you're thinking already. This is kind of crazy. Well, it is. Let's say a person comes by and they do the same exact thing. They come by and they punch that needle that's right on the surface of your leg with the same amount of force that they punched over here. Are you going to notice a difference in the amount of pressure? I'm betting that you will. This is going to hurt much more. The needle might go, well, most likely if they're punching, the needle is going to go into your leg and you are going to scream. I don't care how strong you are, you are going to scream. The same amount of force as here. However, here you have an increased amount of pressure because you have a smaller area. So I'm going to write here, smaller area. This is not the situation that you want to find yourself in. However, in some cases, it can be a good thing. And here, where we have the tympanic membrane being 18.6 times larger than the oval window, what that is going to do is cause an increased amount of pressure due to this vibration. 
And what's that going to do? Well, we said we have fluid inside the cochlea, air inside the eustachian tube and inside the outer ear. And we want to match the vibration out here, which is easy, with the vibration in here, which is harder because of the fluid. So once again, the two ways that impedance matching is accomplished so that we can get an accurate amount of vibration inside the cochlea is by having a ratio of 1.3 to 1 between the malleus and the stapes and by having the tympanic membrane 18.6 times larger than the oval window. That's going to cause the fluid inside the cochlea to vibrate in a way that matches the vibration that's happening out here. And then that causes a signal that goes via the auditory nerve to the brain. In the next video, I'm going to talk more about what happens inside the cochlea. So make sure to check that one out. That's it for this video. If you have any questions, as usual, feel free to ask them in the comment section below and I'll be happy to respond to your question. And who knows, I might even make a video to answer your specific question. Also, you can always visit the website at interactive-biology.com for more biology videos and other resources. That's it for now and I'll see you in the next one.